Four years ago, the Republican Party gave to the nation as a presidential candidate a man loved as few Americans of our time have been loved. On Election Day 1952, the American people stood up to be counted. In one of the most dramatic landslides of modern political history, the people swept into office Dwight David Eisenhower, soldier, diplomat, statesman, American. To clean up the mess in Washington and to see the nation safely through one of the most perilous eras in its history. As the Republican Party leaders closed ranks behind the chief executive, a great political team went into play for the first time. There was plenty for the new team to tackle. The war in Korea had been allowed to drag along to a bloody stalemate that had sickened the world. Thousands of young men, Americans and their allies, had been captured, wounded or killed. Honoring a campaign promise, President-elect Eisenhower had flown to Korea to seek ways of ending the war. American soldiers were no longer being killed and wounded in combat. On the home front, where industry had been enjoying a wartime boom, a mortal danger was shaping up. Inflation. Salaries were spiraling. Everyone had money to spend. With the cost of living soaring, the dollar was worth less and less. Quietly, president and party acted. As the Republican 83rd Congress removed hampering controls, prices leveled off responding to normal laws of supply and demand. The dollar held steady. Then came more measures. Peacetime consumer goods pouring into the market halted the rising spiral of inflation. With the dollar back on a sound basis, the nation entered upon the greatest and most firmly grounded period of prosperity in its history. Employment reached its highest level of all time. 10 million more citizens were brought within the social security program and retirement benefits were increased for everyone. Unemployment insurance was extended to four million additional workers. But beyond the millions employed in industry, there were all the other millions self-employed in agriculture. To link farming areas more efficiently with city markets, to speed cross-country transportation, the President and Congress put through an unprecedented and far-seeing federal highway plan of great economic and strategic importance. Under an administration bent on encouraging a full flow of goods, of imports and exports, another much-needed project was at last launched. When finished, the 2,000-mile-long St. Lawrence Seaway, its immense Eisenhower lock already far advanced, will be one of the world's great inland channels. But economic achievements are not all the Eisenhower administration has to its credit. Under President Eisenhower, more has been done to end racial discrimination to break down the segregation of minorities than under any other president since Lincoln. Federal aid to the nation's schools has been one of President Eisenhower's consistent aims. He added a permanent Department of Health, Education and Welfare to his cabinet and has vigorously promoted a far-reaching public health program to benefit all in need, young and old. Never in history has the American family known such well-being. Yet over the nation's head has been hanging a cloud of dark and terrible omen. Out 
of the fearful world shadows cast by nuclear weapons with their boundless capacities for destruction, there spoke one voice, recalling mankind to its senses. The United States pledges before you, and therefore before the world, its determination to help solve the fearful atomic dilemma, to devote its entire heart and mind to find the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. President Eisenhower has done everything possible to preserve and strengthen the defensive union of the Western nations. The NATO forces, which he himself had organized and commanded after the war. His administration has supported the community of free nations, not only by military aid, but by economic assistance and by measures to promote foreign commerce. On a dozen troubled fronts, President Eisenhower's diplomatic team has built up positions of strength from which to parry hostile moves. In spite of all obstacles, a reborn and rearmed Western Germany has been brought into the lineup of free nations. In fostering international friendships, the administration has had a major asset. Vice President Richard Nixon, the first vice president in the nation's history to make his office live up to its vast potential importance. An enemy of communism, implacable in rooting out the communist influence from the policy level of American government, President Eisenhower has been always ready to meet the Russians halfway when they make friendly overtures. At the Geneva Conference of the Big Four, it was President Eisenhower alone who, by his sheer decency and goodwill, captured the confidence of both ally and adversary and emerged at its end with the trust of the world's troubled peoples. This same utter trust his own people have long since given him and which has been his strength and his greatness. Called upon to carry on with the heavy burden of his office, he well knows how vital it is that he be given, if re-elected, the cooperation of a Congress he can count on to support his program. Through four years of progress, the nation has known President Eisenhower's sure guiding hand. It has seen his administration rooting out cronyism and corruption, bringing back to Washington not only efficient government, but a kind of decency, honesty and integrity too long forgotten. From coast to coast today, Americans are looking back upon a four-year record of prosperity and well-being across the land, of decency and uprightness in government, of peace without appeasement. Upon this record, a grateful people, aware of the issues at stake in November, will know how to make their decision for tomorrow.